Um, so I'm very, very pleased to introduce Wendy Friedman. So Wendy is known to many of us because she's a Canadian and has interacted with many of us in the, in the past. Jamie Matthews was reminding me that they were classmates in the University of Toronto a few years ago. Um, Wendy was director of the Carnegie Observatories. She's now a professor at the University of Chicago. She's a world expert in several topics involved, involving uh, observational cosmology and particularly well known for work on the Hubble constant for which she's received countless awards and distinctions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, right now there's a bit of a debate about the value of the Hubble constant and whether there's a tension between different methods of trying to estimate it. And there's, there's really no better person to talk to us about that topic than, than Wendy Friedman. So I'm, I'm very happy to introduce Wendy. So it's all yours. Well, thank you, Douglas. And it, it's a, a pleasure to be talking to you today. I, I only wish I were there in person because I'm realizing that I have a lot of friends here in the audience and it's always good to get back to Canada. And maybe uh, sometime in the future, this will be easier to do. But it's uh, nice to have the opportunity to speak with you today. And and I, I think you probably invited me to talk about the Hubble tension and I changed my title and uh, perhaps it's a bit provocative, but I, I've uh, been looking very closely at the calibration of two methods, the tip of the red giant branch and Cepheid calibrations of the Hubble constant. And uh, just posted a paper a couple of weeks ago in the archive, um, which uh, goes through the, the uh, current calibrations and compares the uh, strengths and weaknesses of each of those methods. So I know it's also a broad audience, so I want to get a step back and give a bit of an introduction to how we measure the Hubble constant and historically what some of the challenges have been. And uh, it, it, so if we you know, think about where we were in, in cosmology 50 years ago, it was a very different picture, uh, but we knew that the universe uh, began with a big bang. The CMB had been discovered in 1965. We were looking at a factor of two uncertainty in the Hubble constant, and that debate went on for uh, more than a couple of decades and was a very unsatisfactory situation. We didn't know the Hubble constant better than a factor of two. We were pretty certain that lambda was equal to zero, and certainly when I came into the field, uh, um, two directors at Carnegie, for example, discouraged me from working on the Hubble constant because we knew the value was 50, uh, they thought. And uh, we knew that because we knew the ages of the oldest stars in the Milky Way, and there would have been a contradiction. And at that time, uh, it, the universe was considered either the, the evidence for an open universe or a critical matter density preferred uh, by theorists, uh, an einstein de Sitter universe, although the evidence for einstein de Sitter um, never materialized. And uh, today uh, we have a different picture which involves uh, an inflationary epoch early in the universe that uh, we started to um, think about in the 1980s with the work of Alan Guth. And the range of the Hubble constant, the current tension is, uh, bounded by the Planck value of 67 and uh, the Cepheid value done by the shoes team led by Adam Reese, the most recent value they're getting is 73. And uh, we live in a universe that's uh, about a third of uh, composed of, of matter and two thirds in this form of a, a dark energy. Uh, and one sixth of the matter is in baryonic form that's familiar to us. And uh, the, the uh, Hubble constant measurements, the, the range of values that we're now speaking of has narrowed really considerably. And the question now is, is this uh, difference between what's being measured in the early universe and what's being measured locally significant? And uh, what does it mean if it is significant? So if we go back uh, to early measurements, of course, uh, Hubble was measuring a value of the Hubble constant of 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And that was revised by Walter Botta in the 1950s, who realized that there were two different populations of Cepheids. And, and that revised the distance scale by a factor of two. And uh, then uh, the Hubble constant came down to this range of 50 to 100, where it was debated for, for these decades. And uh, eventually um, with 
largely with the key project where we're able to get above the Earth's atmosphere for the first time, get many more Cepheid calibrators and calibrate many different methods, secondary methods for measuring distances that uh, we were able in the key project to determine a value of the Hubble constant to about 10%. And we got a value of 72 at that time. And, and now I'm showing you the, the uh, recent couple of decades, all of the points uh, shown right now are Cepheid calibrations of the Hubble constant, beginning with the key project. Uh, most of these values shown here are from the SHOES team. Uh, this one point is uh, our group uh, at that time, the Carnegie Hubble project used the Spitzer mid-infrared space telescope to calibrate the Cepheids in the Large Magellanic Cloud and provide a zero point to the uh, key project data. But you can see the value of the Hubble constant based on Cepheids has remained largely in the low to mid 70s. But what has changed are the quoted uncertainties, which have come down quite considerably. And if we now look at what is coming from measurements of fluctuations in the temperature and now the polarization in the cosmic microwave background, beginning here with WMAP, um, which initially had a value quite consistent with the, the Cepheid value. And that has uh, continued to come down with time. Here are the Planck results and the error bars have shrunk uh, really quite dramatically. This last point here is a combination of ACT and WMAP data, which is um, very consistent with the uh, most recent Planck results. So uh, the uh, comparing now the two and taking the uncertainties at face value, people have argued that there's a four to five sigma tension. And certainly in physics, this level of, of discrepancy um, merits a title of, of crisis. And that, that's what people have been now uh, very excited about. If it's real, then it offers a possibility to allow us to learn about new physics in the early universe that uh, otherwise we would have been unaware of. This now, uh, I've added in measurements of the tip of the red giant branch, and I'll spend some time uh, telling you about the red giant branch method. It's not as well known as the Cepheids. We all learn about Cepheids as undergraduates. It's a classical textbook means of measuring the distances to galaxies. The um, tip of the red giant branch method is um, our most uh, uh, what we published a paper in, in 2019, which was a first calibration of uh, the supernova distance scale using a large sample of galaxies measured with HST. And we were hoping initially to resolve the uh, debate and uh, that we would end up favoring one or the other, but we landed uh, essentially right in the middle with a value just under 70. And uh, what I'll describe today is uh, some recent tests that we've done over the last couple of years, which um, have resulted in uh, a new value, new calibration of the tip of the red giant branch, which I think considerably strengthens the result. Now, the microwave background measurements have set the bar really high. Uh, it, it, this is now the fit to the angular power spectrum um, here for the temperature fluctuations and on the bottom plot uh, for the polarization. And uh, with only a six parameter fit, you can see that there's this exquisite fit to the um, power spectrum. So this is a, a lambda cold dark matter model and uh, you don't measure the Hubble constant directly, given this model with the six parameters, you can then infer what the value of the expansion rate would be today. And when you do that, you get the value of 67, 67.4 um, plus or minus 0.5. So it's, it's a precision of better than 1%, assuming the Lambda CDM model. So it's a model dependent result. And that's a model that you would wish to test and that we can test locally to determine if there's physics missing uh, from that model. But the bar, as I said, has been set really high. We, we are not talking about 1% precision, let alone accuracy yet in, well, I, I don't believe we're talking about 1% uh, precision or accuracy in the local distance scale yet. It's a very tall order. 
Now, if you compare, this is just the uh, relative probability density distributions of the uh, CMB measurements, the Planck measurements, and the TRGB. Uh, this is uh, a paper, this is from the uh, paper I posted a couple of weeks ago, and uh, giving a value of 69.8 with an uncertainty, it's about 2.4%. So if you only looked at the CMB and the tip of the red giant branch, there is no tension. And uh, this is consistent with the result that we published in 2019. And at that time we had only a single calibrating galaxy in the nearby universe, and that was the Large Magellanic Cloud. But we now have four calibrators and I think uh, it, it now leads to um, at least for me, gives me much more confidence that the tip, tip of the red giant branch calibration is much more secure at this point. So the, the tension with Planck is insignificant uh, given the current uncertainties. And, and just to summarize what I think the status of, of the situation is in, in uh, this year, uh, we, we really have continued to improve the, the accuracy of the distances that we can now measure. And uh, the values of the Hubble constant have continued to converge with time based on different methods. And uh, so whether you infer the value of the Hubble constant from measurements of CMB fluctuations or measure it directly in the local universe, the kind of differences we're talking about full range now are 67 to 73. That's uh, an 8% difference. Uh, that that that's the the entire difference, peak to peak, and the the tip of the red giant branch, as I'll show you, is is based on very simple nuclear physics. It's much simpler. Uh, these are much simpler objects than Cepheids, as as I'll describe, and, and I think that makes them less susceptible to systematic uncertainty. And, uh, and so I, I will just state that I think to within the current uncertainties, this local measurement of the Hubble constant is consistent with the standard Lambda CDM model. Um, it's interesting, the reaction to this statement, uh, a lot of pushback of people now looking for ways to explain the discrepancy. <laughs> they don't want it to go away. And it hasn't gone away. They, they, we have more work to do to establish whether the discrepancy is real or not. But uh, based on the, the current measurements uh, with the TRGB, uh, there, there's no need for additional physics. So why is the Hubble tension interesting? Well, the, the, uh, it is interesting. <laughs> I think uh, you know, it would be great if we could find a way to you know, identify cracks in the Lambda CDM model. It's a model that fits a, a very wide range of data remarkably well on remarkably vast set of scales. And uh, it, it looks to be a very successful in many different contexts, but we have no physical understanding at this point of, of dark matter. We don't know what uh, the fundamental uh, physical nature of dark energy is. We don't know what gives rise to the inf inflaton. There's a lot we don't understand about this uh, model. And so it really is vital that we undertake tests of it uh, and look for cracks because that's how we'll understand if there is new physics and, and these discrepancies will, could hint at what could be going on. And as I said, so the, the Planck results give a value of Hubble constant, assuming lambda CDM to better than 1%. And so it really is up to those of us who are measuring the distance scale locally to improve our accuracy if we're going to make claims of, of additional physics, uh, we, we want to have the accuracy that will allow us to make that claim. It, you know, it's a Carl Sagan, extraordinary claims do require extraordinary evidence. So if uh, the, the difference is real, say there are no systematics and, uh, and we are able to establish that there is a difference between the, the local and the distant early universe uh, Hubble constants, what could explain that? And uh, a lot of effort in the last several years has gone into looking at potential uh, physics that might be missing from Lambda CDM. A lot of effort uh, early on suggested that maybe there was an additional uh, neutrino or other form of dark radiation, but the, the now measurement of the peaks 
uh, at small angular scales are so well determined that if you shift things and change the value of the Hubble constant, you're going to move those other peaks. And now the data just don't give you the, the ability to do that. Now, it could be that you have something that could get you to 70 and some of these methods will get you there, but nothing so far has uh, emerged that will get you to 73 or 74. The, the, the constraints from many different directions now have just become too tight to do that. For example, people considered maybe there would be a different equation of state for dark energy. We don't know what the dark energy is. Maybe it, I mean, it's certainly consistent now with Einstein's cosmological constant with a value of W, which is the ratio of the pressure to the energy density of minus one, but perhaps that evolves uh, over time or redshift. Uh, but now measurements of baryon acoustic oscillations, which are reflecting the fluctuations in the matter density have become such that you just don't have, again, the ability to change things in an arbitrary way. Uh, and, it's, and if you add in data from type 1a supernovae, uh, then again, you cannot get to uh, a value, a local value of 73 or 74, just not allowed by the current data. And many other uh, possibilities have been looked at, um, massive dark matter particles that are decaying, uh, modified gravity, of course, non-zero spatial curvature. Uh, people looked at non-Gaussian primordial fluctuations. And, and most recently, I think most of the effort has gone into some sort of early universe physics, and that would be prior to recombination so that you don't see this effect on the, the um, smaller scale uh, uh, peaks in the CMB. Um, and so some uh, model, perhaps we have a, a scalar field that uh, modifies the expansion rate and then uh, somehow is able to disappear and, and uh, so that you don't see its effects later on. And again, these models uh, might get you to 70 or so, um, but they're not getting you as high as 73 or 74. That turns out to be a very difficult thing to do. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but nobody's found a way to do it. And these models are uh, somewhat contrived because you have to posit that you have this uh, scalar field and somehow magically it disappears just when you'd have other constraints on it. So that, that hasn't, uh, there, there's nothing obvious. Uh, there's no indication in the CMB that uh, there is a, a, a higher value of the Hubble constant or something that doesn't fit. And also if you try and simultaneously explain a, a somewhat less, um, a, a smaller uh, um, difference with uh, sigma eight fluctuations on eight megaparsec scales, it, uh, makes if you try and solve the H naught problem, you make the sigma eight problem worse. So you can't do it at once. Um, so very different than the the um, the state of of the field when um, the the discovery of acceleration was made, which uh, the allowing for a lambda term solved many problems simultaneously. And uh, this one, so far at least, there's uh, there's no way of uh, of fixing H naught without causing a problem somewhere else. So let me turn to the Cepheids now. This is uh, an area that I've spent a great deal of my career working in, and I know and love them well. And I think uh, my statement about Cepheids is at the three to 5% level, they are superb distance indicators. We uh, were able with Hubble getting above the Earth's atmosphere to measure Cepheids in a couple of dozen galaxies and uh, with CCD detectors replacing photographic plates, which happened um, just before the launch of HST. It allowed us to make corrections for dust, which hadn't been done before. It allowed much more accurate photometry, especially getting uh, high resolution images for the first time with HST. And this is the um, Hubble diagram, the classic version velocity as a function of distance uh, from the key project data. And the green points here are for the type 1a supernovae, which you can see extend out much farther than the other methods that we used, secondary methods <laughs> used. One of the, the real advances was that before HST, we couldn't even fit all of these different methods on the same plot because there were no zero point calibrators. That it, we finally were able to get Cepheid measurements for all of these different techniques. And here, um, you can see the, 
uh, the scatter uh, about the value of 72 that we obtained. And these other distance indicators have a much larger scatter. They're closer, they can't observe them as far out and peculiar velocities are a large component, a significant component of the overall expansion velocity. So this black vertical line is uh, denoting a velocity of, of 5,000 kilometers per second. There are many, many more supernovae now that are uh, literally a uh, thousand and climbing uh, that have been observed since the time of the key project. But I just want to point out that, uh, for example, it's now possible to measure the Hubble constant using the Maser technique, but there are exactly six galaxies for which it's been possible to measure Maser distances and uh, they go out to 130 or so megaparsecs. And, uh, and one of the galaxies is uh, the nearby galaxy NGC 4258, which is only at seven and a half megaparsecs. So the, the um, velocity corrections, they are quite large and the statistical uncertainties relative to supernovae are also quite large. Um, the surface brightness technique that's been uh, recently resurfaced, that goes out to about 100 megaparsecs. Again, uh, you have to worry about peculiar velocities, or you make it a, a secondary, you know, essentially three steps to the Hubble constant, and you're calibrating them with the Cepheids. So if there's any uncertainty, systematic uncertainty in the Cepheids, you carry them with you. And at the moment, there's exactly one uh, gravitational wave siren, and it's at a distance of uh, 43 megaparsecs. So peculiar velocities, again, are a significant component of the uncertainty in the Hubble constant that you get. So there are very few techniques that uh, both have uh, large enough samples statistically and have had their uh, systematics investigated, as it were, in a systematic way. And this is the, the final result from the key project. Um, the different methods that I uh, labeled on the other plot are, are shown here in each Gaussian now has a unit area representing the statistical uncertainty in a given method. And the bars here represent the systematic errors in each technique. And the solid black line is the overall cumulative probability distribution. And uh, this was the final result, uh, the statistical error shown here and the systematic um, uh, shown here. And, and the largest uh, systematic errors at, at the uh, conclusion of the key project were the distance to the large Magellanic cloud that again was our calibrating galaxy and uh, the metallicity dependence of the Cepheid period luminosity relation. The distance of the LMC now has been measured many uh, times independently since that time. And in particular, there's now another geometric technique using detached eclipsing binaries. And uh, that technique is, is now uh, giving a 1% distance of the LMC. So that part of the error uh, budget, that component has been reduced significantly. The metallicity, not so much. Now in, um, about a decade ago, we used Spitzer, a mid-infrared telescope, to measure the, the period luminosity relation, or the Levitt law now, in uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud. So this is the 3.6 micron version of the Levitt law as a function of log period. And uh, the stars to the right here are from the Large Magellanic Cloud, and the labeled ones uh, here are from the Milky Way. And it's a sample of stars that have measured parallaxes using the fine guidance system on HST. And so the zero point agrees actually quite well with uh, what we had adopted at the time of the Kiki project. It was 18.5 at that time. And, um, and so the, the distance to the LMC is not much changed. That was the recalibration um, based on Spitzer. And it, it agrees, as I said, uh, extremely well with the new geometric distance that's measured using detached eclipsing binaries. So that, that has been a big improvement since the time of the key project. And the other uh, uh, big uh, pro progress has been made by the SHOES team. Um, and they have measured the Levitt law for uh, 19 galaxies that host type 1a supernovae and extended uh, the calibration of the type 1a supernovae quite significantly. 
And you can see that, uh, so here is uh, the a Milky Way sample. This is a sample in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, the, I didn't point out in the previous plot that the, the scatter uh, in the period luminosity relation at 3.6 microns is only a 10th of a magnitude, which is 5% in distance for a single Cepheid. Uh, so if you have a sample of 100 Cepheids, you're getting sub percent precision. And the reason we don't have sub percent precision is, is due to systematics, um, but, uh, but the, it is a, a, a very uh, precise method for measuring distances. But the scatter goes up with distance, and this is NGC 4258. As you would expect, it, it's harder to measure these things. HST, of course, has fixed resolution, the camera, and so as you go to larger and larger distances, it's harder and harder to get accurate photometry. But even at seven uh, and a half megaparsecs, the distance to NGC 4258, the Maser galaxy, the scatter has gone up by a factor of four. This is M101, it's at seven megaparsecs. And uh, you can see some of these galaxies, it's a, it's a big challenge to find Cepheids in them at all. And uh, that's, that's just, it's a hard thing. Uh, and apparently uh, there are more galaxies coming. They'll go out to 40 megaparsecs. This current sample goes out to 30 megaparsecs, but it's even uh, 40, even maybe even 50. Some of the galaxies are at 50 megaparsecs. So that, that, is, that is a hard challenge. So the question becomes, what do we need to do to take the Cepheid me uh, measurements up to the next level of accuracy? And the, we talk about a Cepheid period luminosity relation, but it's actually a, a Cepheid period luminosity color. The color is um, reflecting the temperature of, of the Cepheid. It's an actual physical reason for the, the color spread in, in the period luminosity relation. And uh, we believe that there is an effect due to metallicity, but that is very difficult to constrain empirically. And, and that's been studied now for about 30 years. And the slope, this gamma function, um, it, it has not converged. It, uh, people don't even agree on the sign, uh, let alone the magnitude of the effect. And we don't know what the actual metallicity of an individual Cepheid is. They're too faint to get spectra. And so uh, we rely on uh, measuring the oxygen to hydrogen abundance of nearby H2 regions in the galaxy that are nearby. And we hope that it's some reflection of the Cepheid metallicity. So these many parameters make getting a 1% measurement of the Hubble constant a considerable challenge. And I think uh, upcoming, we really do need to pay uh, close attention to this value gamma and, and uh, determining the metallicity coefficient and also the image resolution. Because as I said, as you go farther in distance or even in the interior regions of, of the galaxies, as the crowding and blending of images goes up because the surface brightness of the galaxy goes up, it's harder to get accurate photometry. And if you get the, um, the color wrong, here's your color term. So this is, you make observations at different wavelengths um, and, or you get your gamma term wrong. If, you, if there's crowding, that's make it, you, then you're gonna get the reddening wrong. And these effects are covariant and could lead to a systematic uncertainty. So this is, um, uh, I'll describe a little more toward the end of the talk. I think where JWST will help a lot. And we've just gotten time on HST to study uh, Cepheids and the tip of the red giant branch and another method using carbon stars. But in the context of the Cepheids, we will have four times the resolution of uh, the HST infrared camera. Uh, longer uh, baseline uh, out into the infrared to measure the dust uh, more accurately, and then also a filter that will allow us to directly determine whether you have a high metallicity or a low metallicity Cepheid and not have to rely on this uh, oxygen to hydrogen ratio of the H2 regions. It'll be a direct measurement of the, the Cepheid metallicity itself. So I, I think it, I, I'm optimistic in the next few years, we really will be able to um, uh, improve these measurements quite considerably. And, and just to show again, I think why we need to be a little bit cautious about uh, thinking that we are at the 1% level. I, I'm showing here some of our key project fields and these are optical V-band images. And for those of you not used to looking at nearby galaxies, so these are of course uh, negative images. So the white patches here are the dust, Cepheids are marked and circled. 
um, we're, the Cepheids are young, so they reside in the disk. We have no choice. Uh, we find them in the disks of galaxies and we need to correct for dust and, um, and also for this metallicity effect. And as we go out farther, so going to uh, 40, more than 40 megaparsecs, then this resolution issue then becomes a real problem. And this is the optical. Um, Cepheids are fairly blue. Um, we had argued early on, you wanted to go to the infrared as far to the red as you could, because then the effects of dust are much less because of the extinction law. The effects of dust uh, in the infrared are much lower. And, and that is true, um, but when you run into a resolution problem, uh, that, that uh, becomes uh, less of an advantage, becomes a disadvantage. And so the, um, here's the uh, period luminosity relation that I showed you for the Milky Way and LMC, here's 4258 and, uh, and you see 4424 uh, where it was with difficult to find Cepheus at all. So as you progress out in distance, these issues become uh, more of a concern. And now here's a, an image uh, in the optical of a Cepheid found in NGC 4258. Uh, you can see it's pretty isolated. Here's a blow up uh, and uh, easy to do photometry accurately of this star. But now when you go to the infrared for this star where you'd hope the advantage would be that you could correct uh, for dust, the background of the galaxy comes up and ironically, it's the red giants that are now uh, in, in the same field uh, and uh, causing this background and uh, making reliable photometry much more difficult. This is uh, the closest galaxy in uh, the sample, the second closest and one one is closer. Um, and it's um, a 45 day Cepheid. It's one of the brightest Cepheids in 4258. And so the problem is only worse for the fainter Cepheids when you're trying to um, measure their photometry. And it also has a metallicity gradient and um, it, it's, it's a challenge. This is one of the anchor galaxies that sets the calibration of the Hubble constant. It's, um... And then finally, I just wanna say briefly that um, this issue that I alluded to, the metallicity, uh, here's the instability strip here. There's a red edge and there's a blue edge. And these are some um, models of Cepheids that these are low metallicity models on the left and high metallicity on the right. And so if we uh, look, for example, at the uh, five solar mass model here, uh, the high metallicity stars are crossing the instability strip. It, during the course of their evolution, they cross the instability strip several times at a different luminosity each time. And um, we, so empirically, this again is a tough problem. If it, it, when we were trying to measure the Hubble constant at a 10% level, these kinds of effects were not large enough to be of concern. If your aim is to measure them at a one or 2% uh, level, then we do need to worry about them. And it's um, some, something that uh, I, I think we still need to grapple with. So that was the motivation for putting a lot of effort into measurement of a new technique, a different independent technique. That to, if we're going to understand if there are systematic effects in the Cepheids, we need to have another method that at least rivals the Cepheids in precision and has completely different systematics. So uh, several years ago, we set out to measure the tip of the red giant branch in uh, nearby galaxies and the halos of these nearby galaxies to in galaxies that also had type 1a supernovae to allow us to directly measure the Hubble constant. So what are these stars? These are uh, stars of uh, solar mass or a little bit uh, down to lower solar mass, lower stellar masses, and uh, they don't have uh, sufficient mass when the star uh, uses up the hydrogen in the core. Um, the, the, the core collapses, but the temperature is insufficient to ignite the triple alpha process and to start helium burning. And so you have a hydrogen burning shell, that's what's powering the luminosity, and the core is degenerate. And uh, so the star ascends the red giant branch, the temperature is increasing and it's dropping more helium onto the core as it's burning in this shell. And when the temperature reaches about hundred million degrees, 
and the mass at this point is just under half a solar mass, then you have uh, enough, uh, the temperature is high enough to ignite the helium, start the triple alpha process, but because of the degeneracy, you don't have an expansion of the core and you get a thermal nuclear runaway. And uh, the fact that uh, you have this almost constant core, um, means that this helium flash occurs at a, a predictable luminosity. This really is a good standard candle. And in, a, in the observational plane, when we go out and we measure the HR diagram, the color magnitude diagram, luminosity up here, temperature to the left, the, uh, the if we observe, say, in the halo of a galaxy, we observe the red giant branch here, the, and above this core helium flash luminosity, we don't see stars above the, don't see giant branch stars. There are some uh, asymptotic giant branch stars, but many fewer of them. Contrast uh, is actually very high relative to the AGB stars. And, uh, and the stars, uh, once they undergo the helium flash, they settle down onto the horizontal branch and we don't see them. And so what we do in an empirical sense, we measure the luminosity function of stars along the giant branch. And then we measure the first derivative. We're looking for a sharp edge here. Uh, and uh, we've used many different filters and we do artificial star tests. That we, uh, we don't measure this by eye, although we could, <laughs> um, but uh, we do this in a way that's repeatable and, we, and get a good estimate of the systematic uncertainty in the uh, fields in which we're measuring the stars. And uh, in the, the I band at around 8,800 angstroms, the, um, or 8,000 angstroms in the case here of HST, the, um, the, the luminosity of the tip of the red giant branch is really quite constant uh, with temperature or with metallicity as I'll show you in a moment. Now the, um, unlike the Cepheids where we can't get direct metallicities uh, for decades now, people have getting, been getting spectroscopy of giants in the Milky Way and other nearby galaxies. And the color of the giants um, reflects the, the spectroscopic metallicities. This is just an extraction of the magnesium index here for a sample of low metallicity clusters. On the left uh, here, are metal rich clusters on the right. So they're redder when they're more metal rich and unambiguously, you can see the magnesium line here is much deeper. And so when we measure the HR diagram, we can actually empirically see what are the low uh, metallicity and what are the high metallicity clusters. And we can also see that in the I band, uh, there's really very little dependence, if any, on the luminosity of um, the um, red giants as a function of the metallicity. So that's a huge advantage. Um, Here's a field in NGC 4258. So this is the, these are the fields where the um, Cepheids have been found uh, again in the disc. And what we do with the red giant branches, stars go out into the halo uh, away from the disc. And if you plot uh, uh, with a contrast, so you see the, the disc, um, you don't even see the stars in the halo, but with uh, ACS, the advanced camera for surveys, this is the giant branch that emerges. These are these AGB stars. The, the contrast is about four to one. Um, and so the AGB stars provide a pedestal, they contribute a pedestal, but it doesn't uh, uh, prevent us from measuring um, this discontinuity um, very accurately. Essentially, we're just measuring the first derivative of the luminosity function, as I think I said. So here are the halo fields that we observe with Hubble um, for a sample of nearby galaxies that are type 1a supernova hosts. And uh, we go as far away from the disk as we can. We even uh, uh, don't look at the, the parts of the uh, image that are closest to the disk. But you can see the circled stars here are tip of the red giant branch stars, and uh, they're very isolated. This is a galaxy at 11 megaparsecs. And so photometry of these stars is really quite simple. And I just wanted to add out in the halo, the, the uh, amount of dust relative to the disk is, is negligible. So that's another advantage. We're not having to worry about reddening um, and colors accurate enough to get uh, reddening corrections. Now, if we compare the, uh, the tip of the red giant branch and Cepheid distances, the, the gray points that I'm showing here are 
uh, publish values from the literature. So these are Cepheid distances uh, compared to the TRGB. And the red points here are the galaxies, they're more distant, uh, supernovae are rare, that are uh, have type 1a supernova hosts. So these are the galaxies in common for which we have TRGB and Cepheid distances. So you can see the scatter goes up, now, not surprising, you're going to larger distances and it's harder to make these measurements. This is just a blow up of the red points that have supernova hosts in them. But you can also see that in many cases, the, uh, the scatter is larger than would be indicated by the quoted error bars. So there's something that we don't yet understand that's giving rise to this scatter, which is larger um, at these larger distances. One hint maybe uh, you can see here, this is now, these are the absolute magnitudes for type 1a supernovae calibrated using the tip of the red giant branch distances, scatter of about 0.11. And if you compare that with the scatter and the supernova Hubble diagram, it's really quite comparable. But for the Cepheids, the scatter is larger. Uh, these are the same galaxies. Again, the only difference between these two plots is uh, one's calibrated uh, by TRDB distances and the other with Cepheids. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, there's another group, uh, Brent Tully has been working to measure tip of the red giant branch distances and their group has completely independently measured distances, done all the photometry in a different way using different uh, programs, measured the uh, tip um, magnitudes in a different way. And if you calibrate these, there's a sample of 10 that overlap using uh, the same calibration, in this case, NGC 4258, the Maser distance, then uh, the agreement is it, uh, better than the percent level. So uh, these distances do agree to within their quoted uncertainties and, uh, and it's an entirely independent uh, check, which is nice to see. I just want to say a, a few words about supernova. I'm going to try and speed up a little bit here. This is a, a program, the Carnegie Supernova program that Mark Phillips and I were co-PIs on at Las Campanas. We used the uh, range of telescopes on the mountain of uh, different sizes, uh, depending on the, the uh, magnitude of the supernovae. And uh, the aim was to provide a sample that really would allow us to um, deal with systematics uh, in terms of reddening and K correction evolution. We had uh, nine different filters and uh, made sure to really get excellent uh, coverage, phase coverage of the supernova light curves. And um, also uh, spectra, time evolution spectra to allow us to measure the K corrections very accurately. And uh, that's the sample that we use uh, to uh, plot our Hubble diagram, and these are the, the uh, supernovae from the CSP, and these are the, the tip of the red giant branch distances that we published in 2019. And uh, this is, uh, we use a program developed by Chris Burns called Snoopy that allows you to uh, measure the light curve parameters, and then we use that as inputs for a, a Markov chain Mark Monte Carlo analysis to solve for for example, uh, there's a, an observed correlation between the peak luminosity and the host galaxy mass. Um, and, uh, and in the end, we determine a value of the Hubble constant and we get a full covariance matrix. And so here, uh, this is uh, the value that we got. Uh, we slightly uh, had a refinement um, in 2020 based on our uh, measurements of the, the tip of the red giant branch in the large Magellanic cloud. And as I said, at that time, the LMC was the only anchor galaxy that we had. And let me just briefly say that uh, just another comparison of the, the TRGB and Cepheids and I just wanted to make the point that it not only does the scatter go up, but there is a, um, a more significant shift in the zero point of the TRGB and the Cepheids. And so it, I think it's important to realize that if you're going to claim new physics, we really do need to understand these sorts of differences because these galaxies are at a single distance. So the difference is implying there are systematic errors that we don't yet understand. 
and uh, it's not early universe physics. And so we need to get to the bottom of, of this kind of difference before I think we can claim new physics. So the last couple of years, we put a lot of effort into uh, trying to test and uh, uh, provide other uh, galaxies that can calibrate or objects that can calibrate the tip of the red giant branch beyond the LMC. And uh, this is work we did in the Milky Way using globular clusters. It's a, uh, this was a DR2, data release two uh, Gaia proper motion sample. And here there are different uh, metallicity bins for these 46 clusters. And the metallicities span the range of metallicities that we're seeing in uh, the halos of nearby galaxies. We used the horizontal branch to line up the, the different uh, individual globular clusters to provide this composite. So they don't know about the tip of the red giant branch, but we can now measure the tip of the red giant branch. We used uh, the detached eclipsing binary distance to make a send to provide the absolute calibration. And it agrees with the LMC uh, at the 1% level. So a completely independent uh, measurement of the tip luminosity. We also used the archival data from HST for NGC 4258. There are 15 fields available in the archive, which are going out along the minor axis away from the disc. Um, the shoes group have analyzed the tip of the red giant branch in one of the Cepheid fields. But for the reasons that I pointed out, you have dust and you have crowding. This is exactly where you don't want to make a measurement of the TRGB. Um, and uh, when we do that, uh, again, we have a measurement independent of uh, the LMC, but that agrees like, extremely well with what we measured earlier um, from the LMC. Um, so we're, we're talking about differences here of millimagnitudes. It, the, the agreement is really quite good. And then very recently, uh, Taylor Hoyt, a graduate student at the University of Chicago, has uh, remeasured the distance to the Large Magellanic Cloud. So here's the, the um, tip of the red giant branch. Um, and he's looked very carefully at uh, regions where you can measure the tip. You have a very sharp tip. Uh, then there's a new reddening dust map for the LMC. And it, it turned out uh, that when you uh, have a, a uh, a narrow peak, you're in the regions where the, the dust is minimal and, uh, and also where the star formation in the galaxy is, is very low. And he did those quite independently, but you can see, you can, you can really measure a precise uh, position for the tip. And the statistics here are, are really quite phenomenal. And based on the detached eclipsing binary that's um, been measured for a distance measured for the LMC. And now there's also a 2% uh, distance to the SMC. And again, you can measure a very uh, well-determined tip for the SMC. So now there are four calibrators for the tip of the red giant branch and they all are agreeing extremely well. I just want to mention the Gaia results, the early data release three. I think we were all really anticipating that this was going to give us a zero point uh, to 1% you know, type of accuracy. But uh, at this point, there's still a parallax offset. Um, the the um, two arms of the interferometer, um, they move relative to one another and there just isn't sufficient data yet to remove what amounts then to a parallax a zero point offset. It's about 17 micro arc seconds. And uh, one of the challenges is that the offset depends on the position of the star on the sky, the brightness of the star and the color of the star. And it's worse for the brightest stars, which are the Cepheids. Um, and, and if you look with respect to the background quasars, in this case, this is a smooth parallaxes uh, for the large Magellanic cloud, the um, Gaia uh, group has looked into this quite um, closely and, and many other groups also. Um, and there appears to be a, a minimum systematic error floor of, of about 10 micro arc seconds. And so at this point, we're, uh, we're just gonna to have to wait. Uh, we will eventually we hope, Gaia people hope there will be a 1% calibration. But for example, with the globular clusters that I was showing you, it's a 5% uncertainty at the current time. Although, um, the, there's a paper by the shoes team that, that I think is 
optimistic or these other authors have um, concluded they've been very optimistic in the, in the uncertainties. And, and the same is true for the, the Cepheids, unfortunately, we will have to wait. So if we put it then together, these new calibrations that I've uh, described uh, for the LMC Milky Way, uh, the Maser Galaxy 4258 and the SMC, we get a calibration of, of the tip. Uh, and apply those to the type 1a supernovae, the, the supernova sample from the CSP that I showed you. And that is leading to a, a value of the Hubble constant of 69.8. I just want to show, so this is uh, the composite, just a blow up of the tip of the red giant branch region that I showed you uh, earlier, the, the whole uh, color magnitude diagram for, uh, here is a value of, of 74. Um, Tully Fisher, there's a paper that um, uh, gets a value of 76, um, and this is uh, indicating uh, the Planck value here. And you can see, so when we were arguing a couple of decades ago about 50 to 100, just how far we have come. There's, um, you know, we're arguing about smaller differences now. And I just briefly wanted to show uh, these are the uh, relative probability density distributions for uh, the TRGB and Cepheids. And this is a point that uh, George Estafio has been making. Um, the anchors for the Cepheids uh, have changed um, a fair amount. And there's an inconsistency with um, if you determine the distance, for example, to NGC 4258, um, using the Large Magellanic Clouds, the Cepheid period luminosity relation, then you get a distance that's in disagreement with the Masers. And if you say, okay, that is a metallicity difference because the, the metallicity between those two systems is quite large, then, uh, then the tension is somewhat removed. But if you then compare the Milky Way and NGC 4258 that have comparable metallicities, you still get an answer in tension with the Masers. And so that is not due to um, a metallicity effect. And so the, the point that Estafio is making here is that, you know, so here are the geometric distances, here's the Maser distance, uh, here's the LMC distance, but the joint constraint that's coming out of the analysis from the shoes group is really off from those independent constraints. So uh, again, it's an argument that we do need to understand these inconsistencies in the in the Cepheid anchor distances if you're going to interpret before you interpret this as a tension in H naught. So this is a plot that I uh, put in the paper that uh, posted um, a couple of weeks ago, and this is uh, showing the the Planck value. Uh, these are the recent results from the Dark Energy Survey Year Three data. Uh, the TRGB and Cepheids, and I plotted uh, many other methods here and their published, their quoted published error bars. You might have seen different versions of this plot that have all of the many plots that show the Planck and, and uh, BAO measurements to the left and then a long string of, of uh, values to the right, but uh, that really doesn't show you the uncertainties that are involved. And so you can see that you know, neither statistically nor in terms of systematics right now have these other methods uh, been studied in the same detail. And moreover, things like surface brightness fluctuations, um, type two supernovae, for example, are calibrated with the Cepheid, so they're not independent. And, um, and, and so yeah, it, it's not, this isn't uh, the statistical uncertainties we need to worry about. It is the systematic uncertainties, and that's really been the history of, of this field. So um, how do we resolve this tension? I, I, I did speak a little bit earlier about uh, this new uh, JWST cosmology program I'm very excited about. Um, and I think uh, the, the fact that we can use, uh, you know, in the case of the Cepheids and TRGB, these are the same galaxies, but we're going to have uh, better resolution. So we'll understand if crowding is an issue, we can directly test the metallicity, and then we have a, a longer wavelength baseline to improve the reddenings. And, uh, and then we've got this third independent check, and some of you may be aware, Harvey Richer is also uh, working with a group on this method. And I realize I'm close to time, so I'll go really quickly just to give you a, a flavor of this. Um, we, we call this the JAGB method, it's simply use of a particular kind of carbon star. It was uh, this particular 
uh, J versus J minus K, so it's a, an infrared selection, was pointed out by um, Nikolaev and Weinberg uh, a couple decades ago, and they isolated this sample of stars having uh, J minus K colors uh, in this range here. And they were able to show that uh, the luminosity function for these stars could be used to measure the the geometric tilt of the Large Magellanic Cloud. So they're measuring relative distances. And uh, if there were systematic effects, uh, you know, for example, too much dust or differences in metallicity, they would not have been able to tease out the, the geometric tilt of the galaxy. And, and that had been measured in many other ways, including using Cepheid variables and agrees very well with the other methods. And so this is something that uh, Barry Medora and I set out to explore uh, not just relative distances, but uh, galaxies for which uh, near infrared photometry had been obtained and was available in the literature. Um, I'm just showing an example here. This is M33. And uh, this, uh, 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 you can see again, you can isolate these stars in J minus K. Um, and uh, nearly simultaneously, Harvey and I were just talking about this before the talk, uh, Raposh et al. Uh, measured uh, these stars in the Large Magellanic Cloud, and uh, we found uh, quite a consistent result. Uh, this just shows you the luminosity function of these stars. And um, uh, what we did was to compare the distances that you uh, get for the carbon stars with those that uh, are now available for the tip of the red giant branch and, uh, and using the LMC and SMC as, as calibrators, the detached eclipsing binaries again. And you can see the, the agreement is excellent. And these are not data that were taken for this specific purpose. So I think we can do a lot better when we optimize the fields. In some cases, the numbers of, galaxy, uh, numbers of stars in the galaxies are small. But um, even if all of the scatter is coming from the JGB method, um, it, it looks like it's going to be an excellent uh, distance um, method. So, um, and we will uh, extend this with uh, JWST. So let me just conclude um, by saying that I think there are a number of high accuracy and physically based methods that are resulting in values of the Hubble constant between 67 and 70. Uh, that's coming from measurements of the CMB, both in temperature and polarization, BAO measurements, and the tip of the red giant branch. Um, the evidence for the new physics is coming uh, from Cepheids as well as other methods calibrated by Cepheids and other methods that I think uh, so far don't have the statistical power uh, or have been looked into in terms of their systematics at the same level as either the Cepheids or the TRGB. Um, there are systematic errors that we see that are clearly affecting the local distance scale at um, you know, up to the 3% level that I think we need to understand. And, uh, but I do think that discriminating between new physics and systematic errors uh, might take a, a few more years, but uh, with the longer baseline Gaia data and uh, James Webb, and ultimately with other techniques that have completely independent uh, um, systematic uncertainties, like the gravitational waves, sirens, um, we will get to the bottom of this. And I think we can do it uh, really soon. So I'm going to stop here and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Wendy.